they sat down and I said, so I have to tell you guys that I have cancer. And Ben shoved the plate away, called me a liar. Julian, who was four at the time, looked up and said, stupid, dumb breast cancer. Hi, my name is Anne Marie and I was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer at the age of 40. It was hard. Hearing those words, you have cancer, was really, really hard. I felt like a failure, like I was failing my kids as a mom. I didn't choose cancer. It came at me, full force. And the thought of leaving my babies was real. And part of that is because I grew up without a mother, so I thought, well, this is it, you know. They're gonna grow up without a mother too. My mother died when I was one. She was abducted by a man who raped her. When she fought back, he threw her into the river. My family searched for 17 days in that river to find her. Growing up like that was difficult. Uh, I had a lot of pressure on me as a baby, which seems odd, but you know, when that happens, the family turns to the baby for happiness to find some sort of joy. Being a motherless daughter is something you don't really ever get back. I think because of that, I had a depression that people couldn't understand because I was so happy on the outside, but it was because I felt like if I wasn't, I was failing everybody. Sure, there were times in my life, uh, you know, when I was 15, sweet 16, going to prom, that I missed my mom, but there's something about a mom when you're sick. So I was laying in bed one morning and I rolled over and I, my arm like hit my breast and I felt a lump and I pushed on it and lo and behold, black discharge came out of my nipple. On that Monday, I called my doctor and he got me in right away for a, a mammogram and they're slapping it down and squishing it and black discharge is going all over the mammogram machine. The, I guess, mammogram lady, we'll call her, says, oh, I don't see anything on here there's black discharge all over the machine. I don't see anything, let's do a sonogram. So she does a sonogram and she's going over my breast, and again, over the lump and discharge is coming out. She says, I don't see anything. And she checked normal on my sheet. Oh, you should check back with your doctor in six months. I knew there was gonna be more to it, I knew it. When you hear those words, you have cancer, your entire universe changes in that moment. My mother was a very strong, um, stern, independent, loving woman, and that's what I needed at that time. And I didn't have it, and that was hard. It was hard. And sure, there were signs that she was around me. My mom comes to me in a dragonfly. She always has. And it was probably about a year out of my diagnosis, and my son was having a really hard time. We're in the car, and he had finally calmed down, and. A dragonfly fluttered across the front of the car. And my son looked at me and goes, she always comes whenever I'm thinking about it. And he never knew that about my mom and a dragonfly. And I said, what do you mean? He said, that dragonfly always shows up when I need someone. And it's funny because uh, dragonfly sh showed up a lot during my diagnosis. And I don't mean like an actual dragonfly. Like there were times when I had a second opinion and I walked into the doctor's office and she had a freaking dragonfly on the table, like a little statue. Just little things like that. I have an incredibly large Italian nosy family. We are in each other's business probably more than the average person should be. And when I was diagnosed, my family kind of really lost it and they wanted to know everything. So I started a blog because I figured well here, they're gonna get all the information and I don't have to call everybody, it was perfect. I was completely myself on that blog. Misspelled every word, I used way too many exclamation points. I swore a lot. It was not polished at all. And I really believed that my family was the only one reading it. I had no idea other people were reading it until one day I get this message and it was someone from Ireland. And I thought, people are reading this? Why? I was a little shocked that other people were reading it. And I realized that because I wasn't so polished and I was just being myself, asking the questions, that's what people wanted. So 
I realized that my voice could be used to help educate other people going through exactly what I was going through. I didn't realize at the time when I was writing it all and sharing pictures that I was actually leaving something, like leaving my footprint and leaving that for other people to watch and listen to and read about is pretty impactful. My kids are super proud of this. I was scared they were gonna not want me to do any of this and I've shared some really graphic pictures. They joke that their, their friends have seen my boobs more than uh, anything else on the internet, but they got through it. <laughs> and they're, they're really proud of that. They're proud of this story that has been laid in front of many people. And I think the biggest point is I'm one person, I'm one small story. I'm a runner mom from suburbia, you know, sharing her story. And that one story, when you add another story and another story and someone else's story to it, becomes this huge, beautiful book and one that should be read by everybody. Nobody's story is invalid. Everyone's story matters. Now, not everyone could share their stories for whatever reason, and that's why it's important to be the voice for other people, to show a story that they couldn't tell.